All right, everyone, welcome to JM Lectures. We are discussing the eighth unit of grade nine, oh, I'm sorry, the eighth unit of grade 11, uh, physics, bulk matter. Okay, so this is the last unit of grade 11. It kind of seems a little bit random, a whole bunch of concepts that aren't really gone into detail about, but there's some interesting concepts as well. So let's just look at the question that we have here. Question 14 says that an object of mass 150 kg and a volume of 0.75 meters cubed is floating in a liquid of density 0.8 grams per centimeter cubed. What percentage of the object's volume will be submerged below the surface of the fluid? Okay, so again, whenever you see a whole bunch of quantities like this, write down what you are given. All right, so again, when we write down what we are given, we see that we're first given the mass of the object, which is 150 kg. We are then given the volume of the object, which is 0 0.75 meter cubed. And we're also given the density of the liquid that the body is floating in, okay? The density of the liquid of the body is 0 0.8 grams per centimeter cubed. I can already see that we're gonna have to change some units here, but anyway, uh, that's all that we're given, and we're asked to find, we're required to find the volume submerged of the fluid, or the percentage of the volume submerged. So this is how we're going to represent that, okay? I'll explain this in a bit. This is what we're looking for, okay? Let me draw out, so for the solution, let me draw out what is actually happening here. Let's say that our object um, with a mass of 150 kg is just some block like so, okay? So we have some block, and this block, the key point of this block is that it's floating in a liquid. So if it's floating, it's not completely submerged, it's somewhat is above the surface of the water. Some of it's above, and some of it is below. The question is asking, from the total volume, okay? So if I'm considering the whole volume of the object, I'll consider it as VO, from the total volume, the volume we have here, what percent is submerged, okay? So what percent is under the liquid, which is this concept, this quality right here. So this, I'll represent it with Vs, okay? So, uh, the question, like we said here, how you can represent percentage is what amount from the total? So from the total volume of the object, what amount is submerged? Luckily enough, there's a very easy formula to find the volume of the submerged object, okay? So the volume the formula is just simply finding the density of the object, okay, the density of this object here divided by the density of the liquid that the object is floating on. So the density of this liquid is density L or rho L, the density of the object as a whole is rho O. Okay, so we have to find density of the object over the density of the liquid to find this percentage, okay? We'll find some ratio, which is all percentage is, it's just what amount from the whole. The whole is the volume of the object, the amount is the volume of the submerged object, okay? Or what the volume of the whole submerged object. So, let us calculate the density of the object. The density of the object is simply equal to the mass of the object divided by the volume of the object. That's the, the basic definition for density. Simply, density is equal to mass over volume. Here we're specifically trying to find the density of the object, so it's the mass of the object divided by the volume of the object over the density of the liquid, okay? Which these are all qualities, uh, these are all quantities that we're given right here. All right, so before I get into plugging in numbers, let us consider here that we're given the density of liquid in grass, sorry, in grams per centimeter cubed, but we're given the mass and the volume in kg and meter cubed. So let's right here convert those units, okay? So if you wanna convert kg to grams, you simply multiply it by 10 to the power of three grams, into power of three to convert to grams. And for meter cubed, you sum simply multiply it by 10 to the power of six in order to change it to centimeter cubed. So let's plug in those numbers right here. Here we will have the mass to be 150 times 10 to the power of three grams divided by 100, I'm sorry, 0 0.75 times 10 to the power of six centimeter cubed. And this whole thing is divided by the density of the liquid, which are already, we're already given to be 0 0.8 grams per centimeter cubed. Okay, so it's just some quick math over here. What you're going to get when you divide 150 by 0 0.75 is going to be 200 multiplied by 10 to the power of 3 divided by 10 to the power of 6 
you'd bring that up to have a value of 10 to the power of minus 3 grams per centimeter cubed divided by um, 0 0.8 grams per centimeter cubed. And this will be simply converted to 0 0.2 to get rid of this 10 to the power of minus 3 gram per centimeter cubed over 0 0.8 gram per centimeter cubed, almost done here. This will simply give us a value of 0 0.25. And to convert that into percentage, you just have to multiply it by 100 to get 20. I don't like that color. Hold on, I'm going to use red. So this will be equal to 25%. Either the ratio of 0 0.25, or you can use 25%, depending on what the choice is saying. But since the question is asking us about percentage, I'm pretty sure the answer is going to be 25%. So let's look at the choices here. We see, yep, we see that it's answer A, or choice A is our answer to be 25%. So again, all it's talking about, or at least what you should be able to understand, you can just memorize this formula, but you should try to understand what it's talking about. We're asked the ratio or the percentage of the submerged volume of the object to the whole object of the whole. Right, so to the whole object, okay? Or simply, what we found here is that 25% of the object is underwater, and that would mean the remaining 75% is above water. So that's what we just, that's all that we found right here. And it's as simple as dividing the density of the object by the density of the liquid. So if you want to know where this formula came from, it uses the Archimedes principle about buoyancy and about the weight of the object. And there's a video on the Organic Chemistry Tutor YouTube channel that really explains this concept well. I'll leave a link somewhere over here. All right, and that's it. All right, so we're moving on to the next question of the unit eight of bulk matter. And question 15 states as follows. An electric immersion water heater is rated at 400 watts. How long will it take to heat one kilogram of water from 10 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius? The specific heat of water is given as 4.2 joule per gram Kelvin. Okay, so again, I see a whole bunch of qualities, I mean, a whole bunch of quantities. Let me write down the given once more. All right, so the given is, uh, we have power first. The power is 400 watts. It doesn't say power, but I know that the, that watt is the unit of power. And it also asks, it also tells us that the mass of the object is one kilogram or one kg. It then give us, gives us an initial temperature of 10 degrees Celsius and a final temperature of 30 degrees Celsius. Additionally, it gives us something known as the specific heat or the specific heat capacity to be 4.2 joules per gram Kelvin. So you can already see that there's going to be some unit conversions that we have to do here. Um, the required or what we're asked to find is the time. How long does it take is what the question says. Okay, so this question has to do with a concept known as the specific heat capacity. The specific heat capacity represented with C simply means the energy required, the energy to raise one kilogram by one degree. That's the simplest way to understand it. We know that energy, that heat is a form of energy, correct? So if you add heat to an object, a lot of different things can happen. The temperature may increase, it may expand, it may contract. A lot of different things happen when you apply heat to an object, okay? So all specific heat capacity is saying is what is the exact amount of energy required to raise an object of mass one kg by one degree Celsius, okay? Depending on what liquid we're talking about, this specific heat capacity may change, okay? Here we're giving this exact specific heat capacity of water. So let me write a W here. We are given the energy required is 4.2 joules. It takes 4.2 joules to increase the mass of one kg by one degree Celsius. But we see in the question here, we do have a mass of one kg, but the change in temperature is more than one degree Celsius. It's, it's 20 degrees Celsius, in fact, to, write, to raise from 10 to 30. But that's okay. There is a formula that allows us to find the energy required to change any mass, not specifically one kg or one degree, any mass by any degree, okay? And that's the formula we need to use here. The energy required, represented with a Q, 
to raise a certain mass by a certain degree Celsius is by multiplying it by the specific heat capacity and the change in T. So it's Q is equal to MC delta T, okay? So all this formula is telling us is the energy required to change any mass by any temperature using this constant, okay? In this case, again, we're talking about water, so we're using the specific heat capacity of water. Why will this energy help me to find the time? Well, we see that we're also given power, okay? So additionally, realize that power is the change in energy over time, right? So in this case, it's just gonna be equal to Q over T. So we know power. If we find Q, it's as simple as plugging in numbers in order to find T. So keep this in mind when we're trying to find the energy required. So first we need to realize that the units aren't exactly the same here. Here we have grams and here we have kg. So let's change this unit. Let's change this value into grams. One kg is simply 1,000 grams, okay? We, I know that this is Kelvin and this is Celsius, but we don't actually have to change the Celsius to Kelvin, okay? I'll explain in a bit, but just for the sake of simplifying, of being able to simplify the units, let's change this value into Kelvin. So you change Celsius to Kelvin simply, be, simply by adding 273. So 273 times plus 10 will be 283 Kelvin. And simply in this case, similarly in this case, you add 273 to 30, and that would give you a value of 303 Kelvin. You don't actually have to change it to Kelvin, and we'll see why in a bit right here, right? So let's plug in our numbers here. We have that the Q is equal to the mass, which now we know is 1,000 grams, multiplied by the specific heat capacity, which we are given to be 4.2 joule per gram Kelvin, and the change in temperature. Change in temperature would be the final minus the initial, or the final here, 303 Kelvin, minus the initial 283 Kelvin, okay? So if we simplify all of this, we get that the Q is equal to 1,000 times 4.2. We can cancel out these two Gs. We get 1,000 times 4.2, which is four, uh, one, two, three, which is 4,200 Joule Kelvin, because we got rid of the grams, and this 300 minus 283 would give us 20 Kelvin. So why I didn't do this in one step, uh, why I didn't just multiply together is so that you can see this part clearly. 303 minus 283 will give you 20 Kelvin. Similarly, if we had not changed the units, 30 degrees Celsius minus 10 degrees Celsius would still have given us 20 degrees Celsius, okay? So this is why it's important to know that whenever you have a change in temperature, it's not necessary for you to change the units from, from Celsius to Kelvin because a change in temperature will be the same whether it's in Kelvin or whether it's in Celsius. But for the sake of doing this right here, for the sake of being able to cross these two values out, change it to Kelvin so you're sure, so you're absolutely sure that you have the right unit in the end. So again, 4,200 multiplied by 20 will give us a energy or a heat energy to be 84,000 joules, okay? So let's say that, we're not done yet, but let's say that we didn't know the formula for finding energy. Do you see how important it is to realize the units or to write down the units whenever you're calculating any physics formula? It really helps to reinsure that, or to assure yourself that you're answering the question correctly. You see how all of the units beautifully cancel out each other so that we get the exact unit of energy which is Joule. It's a really helpful concept or a really helpful strategy in order to make sure you have the correct solution in the end. So again, we are not done yet. We still have to find the time. So if we see this formula here, we know that power is equal to Q over T. Let us rearrange this to find time to be equal to Q over P, right? Let's use that concept right here. Right here, we can get to T being equal to Q over P. Let's plug in the numbers. We just found the Q, the, the Q to be 84,000 joules. And we know the P right up here to be 400 watts. That will give us a final time of, what's this divided by two? 21, oh, I'm sorry, 210. <laughs> These zeros will cancel out each other. And we'll get 210 seconds. Okay, so. That was simple enough in a sense, if as long as we knew basic concepts of specific heat capacity and power, 
This is a, a concept from the Work, Energy, and Power Unit, which has appears multiple times throughout the Ethiopian curriculum. Okay, so let's look at our choices here and, whoops, <laughs> the choices are given in minutes. Simple enough, we just have to convert this to minutes. It's as simple as dividing it by 60. We just have to divide 210 by 60. That will give us a value of 3.5, okay? So the time can also be written as 3.5 minutes. Both are correct but the choice is asked us in minutes, so all we have to do is convert it. So that will be answer, or choice A, 3.5 minutes, will be the correct answer. So to recap again, we first discussed what specific heat capacity meant. Specific heat capacity meant, like the name says, it's specifically to raise one kg by one degree. So it's very specific. But here, we don't want the specific heat, but generally, how can we raise a certain mass by a certain change in temperature, right? Or by a certain degree in temperature. So this is the formula we use. Q is equal to MC delta T in order to find that energy required. And we use that energy or that heat energy to plug it into this formula here in order to find the time, which is what we were asked to find. And that's it.